Good evening, uh, everyone. Good morning. It depends on your location. It is um, my sad privilege to uh, name our Indian Ocean Lecture Series after our beloved Lu'ai Hamad. Lu'ai Hamad was uh, a, keen, a keen learner. He joined the Indian Ocean Seminar with me, Indian Ocean Ethnography, a week before he passed. He picked the topic of slavery and signed in a Google Doc. Lu'ai is greatly missed. I miss him dearly. I miss his unfailing intelligence and quick wit. And what a better way, and what an excellent way to start this than with Professor Dodi McDowell, whom Lu'ai would have loved to listen to and, le and learn from. It is, um, we have, we have two pictures. Lu'ai is in the red jersey, extremely hilarious, a fantastic sense of humor, and a quick wit. He also grew up in Qatar, so uh, he has a lot of Qatari friends who loved him dearly, and so sometimes he loved his thought. So here his cosmopolitan identity coming to fruition on these two photos. Allah yarham lu'ay ma'a siddiqeen wa shuhada. It is now my utmost pleasure to introduce our distinguished Lu'ay Hamad Memorial Lecture by Professor Thomas McDowell. Thomas McDowell is a historian of Africa and the Indian Ocean and an associate professor at Ohio State University. He is the author of Buying Time, Debt and Mobility in the Western Indian Ocean, a study of how credit, mobility, and kinship knit together a vast interconnected Indian Ocean region in the 19th century. He will discuss this book today. McDowell's primary research focus is the Western Indian Ocean and the Swahili speaking world. His current work includes a project on the knowledge networks between Oman, India, and beyond in the imperial age and through a biography of a surprising Indian doctor. He is also writing with Edward Alpers a primer a teaching, uh, on teaching Indian Ocean World History for Duke University Press. We'll definitely be looking forward to that. His most read article, however, was a 2018 historical analysis of the Black Panther story that was published in the online journal Origins and republished by Quartz Media, searching for Wakanda, the American roots of the Black Panther story. McDowell is a prize-winning teacher whose regular courses included classes on African, Indian Ocean, and global history. He also co-developed and co-teaches a set of interdisciplinary courses on HIV AIDS at the intersection of the humanities and the sciences. Professor McDowell earned his PhD in history from Yale University. I think I, I want to borrow just one minute to say something about the response uh, that some of the responses that Professor McDowell's book had received. Edward uh, Alpers, who is the author of the Indian Ocean in World History, wrote the following. In buying time, McDowell argues for a transnational Western Indian Ocean network of credit and debt 
that link both coastal and interior Oman to Zanzibar and the continental African interior in the long 19th century. With remarkable previously ignored Arabic legal documents at it, its heart, McDowell's analysis is notably innovative in the way it links environmental factors, debt, and mobility. Pierre Larson, who was a friend of the Indian Ocean, the late Pierre Larson, wrote, if scholars have long known in a general way that Oman and East Africa were connected, McDowell traces out many of the specific and unexpected ways in which they were. In the stories and actions of specific persons, this is new territory. If Warab Dasai wrote about commerce with the universe and oceans connect, today, McDowell Dodi is going to show us in based on these legal documents and the Arabic sources and his expansive knowledge, how did that happen? How, how, how are we to believe that ocean, oceans indeed connected? So um, I don't know if Dean Ahmed Dalal is here because he wanted to say a couple of words. Dean Dalal? Uh, I, I am here, yes. Okay, Thank please. You. Thank you, Ruqiyya. I, I will not uh, take much time. Thank you so much for, uh, for giving me a chance to say a couple of words. This year has been a very difficult year for all of us. Uh, we lost the beloved member of our community, Lu'ai Hamad. I don't know why he... Uh, uh, Rukhaya, okay, do, you, yes. do you see me now and do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to say a couple of words. Uh, this year has been a very difficult year uh, uh, in so many ways, but probably the biggest loss that we've suffered this year is the loss of a beloved member of our community of Lu'ai Hamad. Lu'ai is the son of another member of our family, of our community, of Aphrodite, a brother of a graduate of Georgetown, of Leith, a friend to many of you uh, who knew him, cherished him, and loved him and uh, as a friend and as a student. And nothing, of course, can ease uh, the pain of a loss, of a tragic loss like this, uh, except time. But I hope that in time we will also have a chance to, uh, uh, I, I hope that in time we'll have a chance to celebrate his memory and, and, and all the great things that he stood for. Uh, and I'm grateful to the Indian Ocean Working Group for naming uh, the Distinguished Lecture Series in his name after his memory. And I hope we'll be able to do a lot more uh, on, on, on this front. I'm also grateful for the Indian Ocean Working Group uh, for uh, striving to reimagine our work and our research at a time of uh, hardship and distress. Uh, I think it's, it's, only, it's only apt and appropriate that we name this lecture series in this spirit after, after Roy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dean Dalal. Much appreciated. Okay. Uh, we will turn now to Dodi. Please go ahead, we are all yours. Okay, thank you so very much um, for, for that kind introduction. I'm very, very happy for the opportunity to speak to, speak to you today. Um, and I really would like to thank Rogaya Abu Sharaf and Uday Chandra of the Indian Ocean Working Group for this invitation. Um, and thanks also to Taha Kalim for making the arrangements and for Zubash Shakir for coordinating the event. I, I'm so grateful that you have me or having me here today. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about my work on the history of the Indian Ocean and deep historical connections between Africa, Arabia and the Gulf 
and India. I wrote my book, Buying Time, Debt and Mobility in the Western Indian Ocean, to try to explain some of the historical forces that shaped this history in the region. So let me, I'll share some slides so you don't have to only look at me. Uh, and we can, and you'll have some things to talk about. Um, so I wrote, I wrote this book to, to try to explain some of the, the processes in this, re in this region. And so I want to talk you through that today. And as, as luck would have it, recent events in the Gulf have given us a convenient jumping off point for, um, it's because news watchers in the Gulf who have an eye to world historical events or sensibilities may have missed a recent story of deep historical resonance. While they focused on the Emirates and Bahrain, something amazing has happened in Oman. So Gulf states, the, the, the news of diplomatic ties between Bahrain and Israel announced earlier this month and between the UAE and the Emirates announced in August have registered in many places as a big, as a big story. They suggest a realignment in the region and a new chapter of the Arab-Israeli conflict um, and, and things have flowed out of, of 1948. But, but this is not the story I'm talking about. A little reported story signals a much deeper history of politics and mobility, a history that predates the nation states of today's Gulf. Earlier this month, two days before his 91st birthday, Jamshid bin Abdullah, the last Sultan of Zanzibar arrived in Oman. He'd been living in exile in Britain since his government was overthrown in January of 1964, throwing the Zanzibari world into disarray. Although Jamshid bin Abdullah sought permission to retire to Oman many times in the intervening years, he had been denied. So let me pause here to say that if you find it surprising that the long deposed Sultan of Zanzibar an Indian Ocean island off the coast of Africa would wish to retire to another sultanate, Oman, in the Arabian Peninsula, then I can promise you that you will learn a great deal from this talk. If the historical connections between Zanzibar and Oman, however, are something that you're more familiar with, I hope that what I have to say today and what you'll find in the book will deepen your appreciation for this fascinating history of the Western Indian Ocean and what these connections might mean. Because when we study the Indian Ocean, we might think of monsoon winds and dows, um, because it's this, this system of winds that have made this vastly connected space of the Indian Ocean, um, connect, made it connected since the earliest days of human navigation of the sea. And the period that I'm talking about in the 19th century witnessed even more important changes. For it was Jamshid's great, great, great grandfather, Said bin Sultan al Busaidi, who was the ruler of Oman uh, in the early 19th century. In the 1840s, he moved his capital to Zanzibar and ruled a realm that included territory in Arabia on both sides of the Gulf, in, in Baluchistan, in modern Pakistan, and a long swath of the African coast with some claims on the East African interior. So this, this dominion under Said bin Sultan is part of the legacy that set into motion Jamshid bin Abdullah's short career as the Sultan of Zanzibar in the early 1960s. And so in his arrival in Muscat earlier this month um, and retiring to Oman, he completed a circle of mobility that his great, great, great grandfather had begun. Um, so, but indeed, to be clear, Said bin Sultan, the great, great, great grandfather, was not the only person who traveled to East Africa or between East Africa and Arabia in the 19th century. And one of the reasons that I wrote this book and spent years researching this topic was to better understand the everyday people in this region and the ways their actions created an interconnected world. So it was their newfound mobility underwritten by various forms of debt that is the subject of my book and what I wanna to talk to you about today. So let me start by just giving you a thematic overview of what's, what's going on here, uh, of what's going on in, in, in the book. Um, I really, I, I try to pay attention to five, five themes that run, run throughout the book. Um, time, debt, mobility, kinship, 
and environment. And these are the themes that I use to sketch these growing linkages across the Indian Ocean in the 19th century. These spring to life uh, in, during this period because in the 1820s, an increasingly interconnected world economy or globalized economy made, made it possible for traders and patrons and clients to take advantage of a set of economic changes. But what I noticed is that, um, in the, that part of taking advantage of, the, of new opportunities in, in this world is that sometimes their initial strategies didn't work out. So when those strategies failed, when they met resistance from entrenched hierarchies, they bought time. What I mean by this is they temporized. They, they put off decisions or they decided, they decided to wait to see what happened. Um, so they temporized to escape drought, to seek new markets, to acquire ivory, to reconfigure their life paths, and often, but not always, to pay off debts. So I'm talking here in the history of Africa and Arabia, a time before formal European colonization or in even the kind of informal empire that came, that came to the Gulf. Um, but in that half century before European colonization of Africa, Arabs and Africans and Indians used credit and new, new circuits of mobility to seek out new opportunities, establish themselves as men of means in distant places, and to maintain families in a rapidly changing economy. So I'm, I'm placing this within a, a network of a scholarship of Indian Ocean history. Um, as, as Professor Abu Sharaf re referred to, this idea of oceans connect um, talk, takes us to history's oceanic turn and seeing the ways that oceans make, create linkages between places and make that possible. The earliest and best known work on, on this um, was Kay and Chowdhury's work on the Indian Ocean. And, and that notably, but many things that followed, left Africa out of this story, right? These, a lot of these Indian Ocean stories are focused on, on the sea and focused on port cities, but it, it's in, important to see the connections beyond the port cities uh, and, and, what, and what's happening there. So Indian Ocean history is a growing field. The working group here at GUQ uh, has been uh, a great place for people to gather and share ideas and they put on some great, great meetings. Um, Indian Ocean history, uh, as a, you know, you can think of it as a subfield of world history or a, a super field of, of area studies, helps us see processes that would not be available if we we're looking from the point of view of nation states. So it breaks down boundaries and helps us see things in, in new ways. A lot of people doing interesting work. So I'm certainly building on the work of people like Abdul Sharif and Edward Alpers in the Indian Ocean, um, the Omani historians, uh, people have worked on Oman, um, JC Wilkinson and Reda Bakker. Um, and there's a whole generation of happy to be part of a, a group of amazing scholars who, who are working on, on this topic more, more broadly. Um, you know, Jeremy Prestold and Mandana Limbert, Matthew Hopper, Pedro Machada, Fahad Vishada, Holly and Wint, um, Nate Matthews, like there are a lot, lots of interesting work that, that's coming out. And also this, this broader interest in mobility and, and the mobility of, of groups. And so Eng Sing Ho's work on Hadrami Sayeds and Sebo Aslanian's work on Armenian merchants um, lets us use, use new sources to reveal Indian Ocean mobilities. And so I'm definitely building in, in that tradition. Um, so just to give you a sense of the book, here's, here's the, the table of contents, you know, so just like skimming it before your seminar. Um, and, you know, what I, what I try to do here is to um, draw out um, this interconnections between the interiors of Arabia and the East African interior as moderated by the East African coast, the Swahili coast. So in the first chapter, I'm looking at the way that, that drought and other environmental factors in Oman um, encourage people or gave people reason to leave, leave Arabia and seek out uh, new lives and livelihoods elsewhere. One of the key pieces of, of, of this is a drought in the 1840s, which uh, at one point people are unable to make halwa, the famous Omani sweetmeat, to celebrate the Eid in, in 1845. Um, so seeing, seeing how that, seeing the environmental effects um, and, and, and going beyond a kind of great man history to think about Said bin Sultan, um, not that he mo he's the prime mover, but what are what were everyday people in Oman and people living in the interior, not just the port cities, um, how do they get drawn into Indian Ocean networks? 
if when arriving in Zanzibar in chapter two is, is really about the power of the customs master and the, the customs of credit that occurred in Zanzibar. This details the way that people used debt and, and the arrangements that were in place, even in the 1840s, drawing on a long tradition of um, Islamic uh, debt and acknowledgement of debt uh, and the way that those played out at every level of society. Uh, the, third, the third chapter looks at the mobility of sultans in, in Oman and in, in Zanzibar, because when Said bin Sultan died, the two ends of his realm were divided between his sons. And so what happened to Jamshid being in exile in, in Britain for more than 50 years, in some ways doesn't look, with fluent Indian Ocean lands, doesn't look so different than the careers of his great, great uncles. So for instance, Bargash bin Said was um, exiled to India, to Bombay, for two years, um, where he was put on a, on a stipend um, and eventually allowed to return to Zanzibar and became a sultan. Um, his, another great, great uncle of, of Jamshid, um, Turki bin Said, was exiled, to, uh, was exiled to Bombay as well. And his family, when he tried to go back to Oman and reclaim the sultan, his family lived in, in penury um, and, and, the, and British had, the British had to um, intervene to pay his debts. And so in the same way, Jamshid lived in, in England on the, on, with an allowance from the British government in order to, as their way of keeping, keeping balance of power in this region. So that chapter three is where it, it, it balances there. Um, next, I'm interested in the way that Indian Ocean identities move and the kind of resonance they have um, as in this, as people move across this world. So um, and looking particularly at some Arab identities that, that end up operating in the interior of East Africa and what, what happens there. Chapter five focuses on the um, notorious traitor um, and turned colonial agent for the Belgians in the Congo, Tibu Tip, um, seeing him not, not as a kind of proto-capitalist who as through his own dent made, made, uh, made this world connecting the interior and the coast, but instead to look at the kinship networks that he operated in, his, kin, kin, his Arab kin and his African kin, and the way he was able to use these to, to build the world that he was in. Um, I'm interested in the role of, uh, the, of freed slaves and, and the people who were able to gain manumission before slavery ended in 1873 in Zanzibar. So this looks at the history of Islamic manumission in the region, and, and which is an often overlooked part of manumission. Um, and the, the next, and I'll talk more about this, the next chapter then deals with what happens after this, um, the slavery is abolished or, or the slave trade is ended in 1873 and the, and the ways that to maintain mobility of Africans on the Indian Ocean, the kind of subterfuge and documentary double dealing that happened to make, to make that possible. I'm going to spend more time today on chapters eight and nine, which are kind of micro histories. One is tells the story of the first Dow that was built on Lake Victoria, a vast inland sea of East Africa. But this, the Dow is this, this sort of emblematic form of, of sailing vessel from the Indian Ocean. And the next turns, so that's looking at the interior of Africa. And the next one looks at the interior of Oman and to see the way that Saleh bin Ali um, used, used debt and his relations in Zanzibar to, to finance and fund a set of rebellions that, that took place throughout the 19th century. So that's, that's the world I'd like to sketch out for you. That's the world of the book. And I'll, I'll say a few things about these, these different pieces. So one thing to keep in mind here is you know, to see these connections of this world. I mean, here we have a map to make sure that we understand that we're talking about Eastern Arabia and then all the way into the center of Africa and this, uh, these, these connections, the interior oasis settlements of Oman to the Congo River watershed. So we can think about process geographies and other things that, that make, these, make these connections. But, you know, as a historian, I've got to geek out on the sources for a minute here. And just to say that, that what makes this possible, makes possible the stories I'm going to tell you, is a trove of Arabic business contracts, sales and loans and things that you might call a mortgage, but uh, have, are slightly different, um, that took place and, and were contracts that were taken between a diverse and highly mobile population. These wataka or, or writings um, uh, end up being the, the cornerstone of what I'm, what I'm getting ready to tell you about. And so the reconstruction of reconstructing the world of these documents, I've been able to trace a variety of non-elite people across vast spaces and also gain greater insight into the more established merchants and leaders in East Africa, in Arabia, 
and in the African interior. So, you know, this is, is, is trying to correct this um, long-standing blind spot in Indian Ocean history to see Africa in the Indian Ocean and in the Indian Ocean in Africa um, and, and where those things, where those things uh, connect. One of the key connection points is the port city of Zanzibar, this, this island off the, the coast, south of the equator, just off the coast of Africa. Um, a, an Indian Ocean approach helps us make sense of Zanzibar as a nodal point, a meeting point of the Indian Ocean and Africa. Um, and the uh, Arab Sultanate that, that established itself there in the 1840s ends up ruling, ruling over this. Um, but I think, as I said, I would like to look beyond just the sultans and the rulers to think about other kinds of people who are in this space and to think about how their mobility and debt um, fit together. A clear example of this is Juma bin Salim, um, who uh, here I have one of the documents where he acknowledges a debt of ivory that he is going to uh, that he's going to pay back um, within two years. So 10,500 pounds of ivory. Um, and then the inset is a picture of his house in the Eastern Congo in the 1870s. So here's someone who stood astride the credit networks in Zanzibar and also living and collecting ivory in the far interior of East Africa. Um, and so just to step back and look at his, his world in a bigger, in a broader view, you know, his, he's, um, he's identified in that, in that document as Juma bin Salim bin Mubarak al-Bakri al-Nizwi. Um, so he's from Nizwa in, in, in Oman, interior Oman. He was born in the 1830s. Um, he used, he traveled to Zanzibar perhaps at the same time as this, or due to this drought or other conditions. He used credit in Zanzibar to trade, um, to, to get into trade and to be able to partake in the ivory trade. The key aspect of this was American cotton sheeting that was coming in from the mills of, of, of New England. Um, it was called Merakani, uh, the cloth, the word in Swahili. And, and Juma has been known, is known often in the literature as Juma Merakani, a nickname that he got from his extensive trade in cloth. This cloth allowed him to amass tons of ivory that he kept, he kept in the interior, uh, was saving up. Um, and it seems like he, when he died in, in 1887, he was sitting on a store of it and had not been, had not been east in some time um, because he esta had established himself there. Um, so part of what I'm arguing against broadly is it's not just that people from the Indian Ocean world went to the interior and came back, um, but some people settled there. We can see the, the, the um, settlements that, that rose up around that and the set of cities in the East Africa interior. So, um, Jum, Juma Merakani, you know, had extensive holdings. He grew rice, an Indian Ocean crop, and maize. He had a number of African wives, including uh, his trusted partner, a woman from Uganda. He met a number of European explorers, and so the kind of, in this period, a search for the source of the Nile, he becomes an informant uh, and a source of, of European knowledge about this. Of course, he's also depending on knowledge networks that he was part of, of, with, of Africans and, and people who came before him. So in, in just looking at his life, we can, we can see, uh, we can see that this, we can see the way that this world and mobility comes together. Um, he used, he used that, he used that debt to buy time, to buy two years to track down the ivory and bring it back. It's, it doesn't seem that he brought it back at all. Um, and, 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 and so one of the things that happens after he died is to try to sort out his debts and make, make sense of that. So, I just signal, I want to point to Juma Merakani because he, uh, as a figure, kind of stands for this extreme mobility between across this whole, this whole region. But he also is a relatively elite merchant. Uh, so what happens when we look at, at other people, um, formerly enslaved people and others? And so in this next section, I want to say something briefly about um, what happens on, on Lake Victoria and how it is uh, a free slave from Zanzibar um, ends up on the coast of Lake Victoria building a dhow. And as a, a missionary observer noted, noted, his settlement was a second Zanzibar, a kind of reproduction of coastal cosmopolitanism and the kind of an Indian Ocean system that had been in, in place. Uh, so we see here 
the, a document that was from Msaba, the freed slave of Talib bin Abdullah bin Muhammad al Ma'uli, um, and his, his debt and what he is supposed to pay back. Um, and to make this happen, um, Msaba had a plot of land in, in Zanzibar. It seems that he, it was given to him when he had been manumitted, um, and that he was able to parlay this plot of land into a loan uh, and, and a time sale so that he could come back, he could uh, earn money to buy ivory and come back and repay this. And so um, these are the kind of documents that kind of, that unlock, that unlock this, this social history and help us stitch together this world that we have understood in disparate pieces and, and bring them together. So we see that Msaba worked with someone called Songoro. They were, they were both had been, they had both been enslaved by this Talib bin Abdullah, um, a family, part of a family that had migrated to, to East Africa from Oman in the early 19th century because of violence uh, on the kind of Omani Arabian frontier um, with forces from, uh, with Wahhabi forces from Saudi Arabia. So this internecine violence in the, in the Gulf drove some people out to, to seek opportunities elsewhere. Um, at some point, they, these men were manumitted uh, and given, both given property. And they used this property in Zanzibar, small holdings, but to stake themselves into the ivory trade, which was ivory was the, was the plastic of the 19th century, uh, a product very much in demand and, and demand for East African ivory drove um, a, a huge economy that flowed from Zanzibar and, and connected many parts of the world. Um, and so they used, part of what I detail in the chapter is the networks of patronage and kinship that they, that they created to build up this settlement on the, on the shore of Lake Victoria, just near what's now Mwanza, um, and, and into what became called a second Zanzibar. And so it was seen as an Islamic space and men dressed as they were at the coast, um, Swahili spoken and, and other kinds of things that mark this space as, a, as an Indian Ocean space. So it's ivory that made this possible. Again, here we see zooming in on this Lake Victoria region, um, but, but um, the ivory's part helps make this interior into an Indian Ocean space. So the, the boom in ivory in the 1860s and the worldwide demand for that. We see the town of Tabora down here is where Tibu Tip's relatives were based, but it also became the base for many um, Arabs and Swahili people from the coast as a trading outpost and it grew into a city. Um, but this is happening at the same time as African polities like Buganda on the, the Buganda Kingdom on the northern shore of Lake Victoria or Mirambo in, in the Urambo region um, were also gaining because of the uh, economic changes and being able to take part in the, in the ivory trade. And so you know, the, the many Arabs went to the Congo um, and, and like Juma bin Salim, who we, we saw, um, but Songoro made his way to, to Lake Victoria. And there again, we see the process of localization and that he married into the royal line of Ukwere Island, uh, which you just, just see here. Um, and he built and began building the first dhow on Lake Victoria. The, the lake was was dominated by the war canoes of the Bugandan kingdom, um, but a dhow under sail um, a lot would, would allow much easier commerce and movement across, across the lake. He did not finish it, and he, but he sold that first dhow to, uh, to missionaries who had arrived and were looking to go to Buganda. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that dhow sunk on its maiden voyage. So perhaps there's a, a metaphor there. Um, but when, but when we when we look at we look at this we we when we see his story though what happens with Songoro and Umsaba who who uh, one of the mysteries of the archive is that, that one they essentially consolidate their debts and and the surviving member Songoro it takes on the identity or takes on the debt and the of Umsaba so it's hard to differentiate them in in the record um, but he ends up being killed because of his reneging on a debt to the uh, to his brother-in-law, the ruler of Ukwerewe, um, and a kind of misunderstanding about the written nature of the document that he had given and the um, and the chief's understanding of that. And so, in this, we we see 
that the, this debt and mobility in the interior of East Africa created many second Zanzibars in Tabora, on the coast of, on, in Lake Tanganyika, in the, in the far interior of the Congo. Um, and th these set of documentary practices around debt also helped replicate this. So that's looking at the interior of, of East Africa and seeing the Indian Ocean world that, that is connected and takes part there. Um, one part, one piece that has been very much overlooked in this history is to think about the interior of Oman and of Muscat um, because you know, in the East African historiography, there's the, the presence of Arabs um, who, who have been coming to East Africa for some time, the Arab Sultanate in Zanzibar, but um, it became clear that many of the people who were coming to East Africa were not from Muscat or from the famous port cities of Arabia, but were coming from the East African interior. And so in try, I mean, from the Omani interior. So in trying to think about uh, and, make, and make sense of this, I discovered the story of Saleh bin Ali. Um, and so I want to talk to you about his Indian, the Indian Ocean networks that made possible the world that he lived in. Um, and so here's, this is a shot of, of Muscat and the port in uh, the early, uh, early, late 19th century. So here we can see kind of the, the world of Saleh bin Ali al-Harithi and who, um, whose father had been an envoy of Said bin Sultan. He'd gone to London and given gifts to Queen Victoria at her accession. Um, and uh, and had also traveled to Bengal. He'd been the governor of Mombasa. He had died in, in, uh, as Said bin Sultan tried to, um, in, to take power in a broader swath of the East African coast. So, but looking at Saleh bin Ali, that's his, his father's side of things. But if we, if we look at his, his life and, and his circumstances, it helps us understand that the political history of Oman during the 19th century um, was tied up in a set of overseas connections and the, and the debt and mobility um, made those possible. So uh, an older view of Saleh bin Ali al-Harithi would, would be that he's an Omani tribal leader, that he's an Ibadi sheikh, so of the, the, um, the particular form of Islam practiced by the rulers of, of Oman. Um, and that he was a frequent rival to the sultans, the Abu, Abu Said sultans um, in, in Muscat. Um, and so, you know, his story looks like a story of the Omani interior, of politics, uh, of Arabian politics. Um, he's linked to Ibadi knowledge networks and tribal confederations. Um, and so, again, Ibadism is an early branch of Islam, um, and Oman has long been the capital of one of the capitals of Ibadi thought and governance. And so, what I try to argue in this chapter in the book is that we have to see Salib bin Ali and, and the 19th century rebellions in this broader Indian Ocean context, because his life helps us see the movement of Omanis to East Africa in the 19th century, his return to Oman in the 1860s, and his subsequent actions illuminate how credit from Zanzibar leveraged power and shaped influence in the interior of Arabia. Um, so, you know, he 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 led these he led um he became uh when he returned to o oman in the 1860s having, having traveled to east africa and and spent time in both zanzibar and in somalia um, he came to lead his clan al harithi clan um, which is the uh, and was the leading uh, member of this broader hanawi faction um he also became when when there was an uprising in uh, Muscat and, and the Ibadi forces overthrew the Abu Said sultans, he was part of that short-lived government. Um, and, and, and that one of the concerns in Zanzibar was that the um, imamate government would come in and take over Zanzibar. That didn't, that didn't end up happening. But um, the Abu Saids re-established re themselves when Turkey came back from his exile in India. Um, and then um, in the latter half of the 19th century, the latter quarter of the 19th century, Saleh bin Ali um, led, led attacks on Muscat, um, four different groups of attacks on, on Muscat. But it turns out in each one of these, uh, as he's challenging the Sultan for power and dominance in the interior and in Oman generally, um, we see that he's, he's drawing on networks of debt and patronage in Zanzibar and, and um, taking advantage of that. Um, so again, just, just 
not to expect you to, to parse this document, but, but we see that he, this is a document that suggests that um, a very close ally of Salih bin Ali is mortgaging property in Oman or, and, or putting a time sale on it to get cash for its value. The property itself is in Oman, but this transaction is taking place in Zanzibar um, using you know, with Likmidas Lada, a wealthy merchant and portfolio capitalist there. And so, but what's pledged in this is property that's in Adariz, Sharkia, in the interior of Oman to, to make this happen. Um, and so, you know, this uh, is about a stone house and land at Adariz as security. It was only 390 Mary Teresa dollars, but it term was another year, some, some time. It was written um, uh, it, to spell out the details of this tra transaction, and it occurs between um, the uh, relatives of Salih bin Ali's wife. And so again, there's no, there's no smoking gun, but the timing of, of a couple of these documents suggest the ways that Salih bin Ali motivated research in 18, I mean, resources in 1877. In earlier rebellions, he'd actually sold property that he himself controlled in Zanzibar. So this, this kind of connection is part of what I'm trying to tease out here to show that Indian Ocean networks of credit and mobility underwrote rebellion in the Omani interior. So this is not about Arab influence only in Africa. It's also about what's happening in Africa, the, the networks there and the credit and, and finance that were being generated, how they could change Omani politics. So these documents are fascinating, endlessly fascinating. So I wanna give a little, a little plug here before I, before I wrap up to say that thousands of these wataka are available online. Um, uh, that you can look at them yourself. So I was fortunate to be involved in a fantastic project that Fahad Bishara spearheaded to collect and digitize thousands of these of these documents. And with the sponsorship of the Sultan Qaboos Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., there's a database of these documents that is online and searchable. Um, so again, the, the link is there. It's called the Ocean of Paper, um, and uh, it's a, a fantastic resource. I hope that you'll poke around there and search and see if it's what you can find. Um, and I really look forward to the contributions of the next generations of scholars that, that could draw from this and, and take advantage of, of this work, this important work. Um, so if we want to, I want to pull things together and, and wrap up and think a little bit about the legacies of, of debt and, and mobility. And here, we have a, uh, a family tree of the Al-Barwani family. This, uh, this poster is about almost a meter high. So it's, a, it's, not, just, it's not full size here. Um, and it, it traces more than 17 generations of people linked to the, the Barwani family, Al-Barwani, who are a family um, who come from the interior of, of Oman, but made their name and their fame in East Africa, where um, they were important, um, important merchants and politicians uh, and helped lead, led the independence government on, that uh, Jamshid was the sultan for in the 1960s. So this document was created in the, in, in the year 2000 by a Zanzibar born man of Omani descent who moved back to Oman or who moved to Oman where his parents had been born um, after, you know, in the 1970s. And so the, the revolution in Zanzibar in 1964 had sundered this, this world and the connections. Um, many people in East Africa found themselves trying to uh, forced out of Zanzibar, fleeing the violence in Zanzibar and looking for other places to settle. Others who stayed um, soon left as, uh, and as they realized that the, the homeland of their fathers um, had experienced an oil boom and a kind of renaissance that made it very attractive to, to go there. Um, but I was interested in this document because it, it reconstructs this family and shows the united East African and Arabian branches of this family. So the Barwani family um, had initially had much more fame in East Africa, but this family tree roots them very much in Oman. So bringing this mobility and, and connecting things back to, back to Arabia. Um, I realize in some part that the work that I have done helps explain the extent of the Swahili phone world and Swahili speakers. And so one of the, this 
you know, the Swahili in the Eastern Congo is well documented, but also there are many Swahili speakers in, in Oman. Um, and they are people who either traveled there in their earlier part of their life as, you know, young men to seek out their fortunes, but also people who are descendants of, of Zanzibaris and, and Omani Zanzibaris who have um, moved back to the, the land of their ancestors. Um, so one of those people and the person who made this map um, is a guy named Ahmed Barwani. And he, uh, this is his picture down below. And he, it turns out, was, uh, when, when he moved to Oman, he had worked initially for the petroleum, uh, petroleum development Oman, uh, but then he branched out and started to make Omani halwa, that treat that in the 1840s, the, I mean, when they couldn't procure halwa, people, it was a sign of drought and people left for East Africa. So the fact that this man from a relatively elite family ends up making halwa um, to reestablish himself in Oman uh, is uh, a nice historical turn. But he also told me a story um, about something that had happened earlier when, when he had received an order for the halwa, this, these sweetmeats, these delicious sweetmeats, that when he received an order for this halwa to be sent to Portsmouth, England, for Sultan Jamshid. This is years ago. Um, but, uh, and he, in this, the story that Ahmed Barwani told on himself was that the Sultan laughed at the idea that he would one day be eating halwa um, in, that had been made by, that had been made by the family, the extended family of his first foreign minister. And so this, this notion of the mobility and the far-flungness of this the Indian Ocean world um, created helps us, brings us full circle back to thinking about um, Jamshid's return, uh, not return, but it, it, some people have talked about this return to Oman, um, but he had not been to Oman before. He was born and raised in Zanzibar, lived a long exile in, in England, and only recently um, has, has landed in Oman, the, the land of his great, great, great grandfather, um, Said bin Sultan, who helped put set this whole world into motion. So um, we've heard a lot about debt and mobility, about the movement of people, of everyday people, um, and also of their sultans. Um, so I'll stop there and be happy to take your, take your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dodi. This is absolutely fascinating. And uh, we kind of start taking uh, questions. So if Uday, if you are following the Q and A, yes, yes. Can you please? Um, please feel free. Questions are open. Just type in your questions, um, and we can kind of take them together in twos or threes. Okay. If I can just ask quickly uh, about the significance of the return of Jamshid. Um, in, in some areas, I read uh, some accounts of the uh, Omanis and Zibaris who fled uh, to Oman after the revolution in 1964. And um, I read how these refugees had to meet people by the shore to vouch for their identity, to verify that they indeed, this is Al-Harthi, or this is Al-Hina'i, or so on and so forth. But to what extent do you think the modern politics of Oman, modern in temporal terms, with uh, Sultan Qaboos call for Zanzibaris to come home? Um, so that integration, obviously Jamshid is going back as a Zanzibari just like the person I told you about, Riyad al Bousaidi, who was born in the palace in Zanzibar and went back, the uncle of Sultan Qaboos, who continues to hold on to his uh, Zanzibari and Swahili identity with all the power he could summon. Uh, and the fact that they continue to speak Swahili, you know, and so, I just want you to uh, help me understand some more. What is a broader significance? What can we take from this event and uh, of the return of this person and his integration? He's 95 years old. If you can shed light on that, that would be terrific. 
Okay, I mean this, you know, I think as, uh, as in the, within the Guild of Historians, we are uh, exempt from having to uh, predict the future or comment on the present, but I can, I can suggest some ways that, you know, the, these historical continuities play out. Uh, certainly, I mean, and I, I will point you to the um, work that Nate Matthews has done on the Zinji bodies and this kind of Omani identity of people of Zanzibari descent um, to, 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 to think about this. But, you know, when Jamshid came, come, came to Oman, the government had no statement. They said, this is, a, this is a matter for him and his family. His children already lived there. Um, and, and so this was granted to him in his old age to allow him, allow him to retire. Uh, and so there is, Oman has, has made, made itself open in some ways to many people who claim Omani heritage. Um, and, and what's changed over time, you alluded to this a little bit, is the degree to which people were welcome and the space that was, was made for them. Um, so again, anthropologist Mandana Limbert has, has written some on this and has other things forthcoming to try to understand these networks because in some ways these, these Indian Ocean formations uh, you know, that predate these, these nation states and are built on both mobility and to some degree, um, not exactly fluid identities, but identities with different meanings in different places. Um, these identities become challenging uh, to square people into the the world of nation states and passports. And, and you can see this in Indian Ocean studies and looking at um, Southeast Asia and the role of, you know, Hadramis in the, the Dutch East Indies and, and other things. So in, in some ways, the story of Jamshid maybe helps us see the kind of the ongoing problems of, of fitting these square pegs into round, round holes and what, 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 the, what the world, the world of, um, of nation states has, has challenged much longer networks of mobility and connection that uh, across the Indian Ocean world. Thank you, um, uh, Dodi. There are a couple of, there are three or four questions now. Uh, one from Fahad. Um, he has a more uh, methodological question about how you go about doing this kind of work. And especially since you might have uh, some of our undergraduates or young graduate students, um, you know, what would you advise them? And then um, I guess there are two, uh, a couple of questions from my colleagues, Phoebe and Amira, um, which you might, uh, but then we also had two questions in the Q&A. Um, one about, uh, was also, is also methodological about tracing kinship networks and how Africa um, is going to feature more in your future work. Um, and then tr and another one of my co colleagues, Trish Kale, has asked a question about the way in which you kind of the five categories that you use and how, um, you know, the, the interrelationships between these three, these five, um, the different overlapping time scales um, uh, that you might be kind of invoking. I mean, how you kind of work through all of that. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll try these and then uh, come back to you for Fahad and Phoebe's questions so that you can yes. talk to um, I'll say a little bit on, on the, the methods and, and kinship that one of the things that these, these documents reveal, um, and, and actually maybe I'll, um, I'll put up another slide, um, is, you know, trying to put the, put things together. When we think about kinship, you know, on the, on the right is, is Hamad bin Muhammad al barjibi who was Tibu Tip, um, and his, um, and his, cousin, um, Mohammed bin Said al uh, who was, and, and they were business partners and, you know, part of this made this, made it, made it possible. Um, Tibu Tip also drew strongly from his connections to his uterine half, uh, uterine or siblings or connections on his mother's, on his mother's side. Um, and uh, so things that w wouldn't be immediately obvious. And so one of the ways that I reconstructed this was in using these, these Waraka and these, these um, Arabic business documents was really paying attention to the names and the genealogies that are built into the naming formulas that, that come about here. And again, I point you to Fahad Bishara's work on this because, you know, he has a whole explication of the kind of legal legal category of personhood that comes about here um, and, and how that happens within these documents. For me, thinking about the social history, these documents and paying attention to the names um, allows us to begin to reconstruct some of the genealogical pieces and then reading those against other kinds of records um, 
explores accounts, you know, Tip Tip himself wrote an autobiography. And so using, using that to, to unpack some of those things ends up, ends up being, being quite important. Um, so it, 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 to some degree, it was the, um, it was my own obsession with detail and, and, and really trying to, to find the little pieces that would help hold all, all these things, all these things together, um, is, is part of that. And then also, you know, in, in, in reading Tibbo Tip's autobiography, uh, really trying to, to see what he's talking about there, like what, and, and part of what he's detailing is an extensive network of Ken, uh, both through marriage and and um, through birth, that that is both that connects Arabi Arabs and Africans in in various settings, um, and sometimes even claims a fictive kinship that you know that his grandmother who had had been enslaved came from a certain area, and he used that for his um, to his own his own benefit, um, and so that, that so that that's that's part of what I what I tried to to do on 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 the kinship, um, and. I think the, this question about scales and time scales is, is an important question and one that I would say I struggled with. And in part, the, the challenge of this book is, is working across so many geographical, scale, geographical regions and also these analytical scales. And, um, you know, read the book and tell me if I succeeded or not. I think there's probably ways that you, to, to, do it, to do it better. Um, and in some ways, the two chapters that I outlined end up being kind of... Um, they're kind of micro micro histories, but world historical micro histories. And so the ways that I'm, I was always interested in the ways that that stories um, and narrative can bring these pieces together. And so again, finding someone like um, the understanding Juma bin Salim of Juma Marikani's story within these things and, and think about what is the environmental aspect of his story and leaving Nizwa as a, as a child. Um, what, how does time, how does time fit into this and what, what he's doing? Um, what do his kinship and these kind of things? So a lot of times was, was trying to think through, think through each of those things. But of course, when we work between scales and move rapidly between scales, which is, is, is fun, things also get left out. And so um, one of the challenges in this book is I'm trying to speak to an Africanist historiography and an, an, an Arabian historiography and an Indian Ocean historiography. And I, there's probably room for all of those fields to find some fault with, with what I did. Um, but it was important for me to try to unpack this world and to bring to light these connections and these mobilities, which have, you know, if it weren't for Jamshi's re recent return or a recent move to Oman, they might be erased by the, the patterns of the 20th century and other things. So I hope that answered that question. Right. <clears throat> Do you want to say a little bit, now that you're on a roll with the methodological aspects and the kind of um, historiographic choices you're making, uh, do you want to answer Fahad's question as well? Sure. And t would you remind me of the question? Um, this is, um, it's just in the chat. Um, this is really about the kinds of training um, and, kind, and the support that would be necessary to carry out the kinds of research that at multiple scales, um, the kind of interconnected histories and so on, also looking at mobility. Right. Um, I think, yes, I, I think I don't have that chat, but I, but I, can, I can certainly answer. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, um, I yeah. It, it, just, it just came up. Um, you know, I think I, for me, my own background, I, you know, I started as someone who was working on the coast of East Africa and it essentially began training as an Africanist, but realized to answer the questions that I was trying to follow, I needed to become an Indian Oceanist, right? And, and so I needed, and I needed to think more about the Arabian Peninsula. Um, so I had done Swahili and began to study Arabic and was able to, to piece these things together. And so I know that there is a, a strong feeling against area studies, but from my own ability to do this work, an area studies background of, of starting from some place and connecting it to another was was very important. Um, and so I think that it's it's um, you know having the language work and people who come in you know who starting graduate programs with languages you know when we're evaluating applications there are always always a leg up, um, and so I think that's that's very important. I also, you know, this project took me a long time. Um, I uh, think that there, 
it meant like letting some things settle and, and, and putting some pieces together uh, and, and seeing and being able to see evidence in, in new light. So between the dissertation and the book, a lot, a lot changed as I, as I did new research, but also um, met new people and, and saw other, other work. So I think that, you know, on the time frames that we're, that at least in the United States, that we want PhD students to finish, um, these projects can, can be challenging, yet at the same time, from the conferences I've been to recently, there's so many, so much great Indian Ocean work that's being done where people are connecting places and thinking about more than, more than one region. Um, so I think that, you know, finding ways to support graduate students in, in this and helping them get funding to be able to go to multiple archives and to be, to be able to, like, a, a, what I try to do is reconstruct the world of these documents, not just look at these documents in the archive. And so how can we follow the objects that we're, that we're studying in, and into the world that they're creating? Okay. Uh, I think Amira yeah. is poised to ask. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much. This was uh, really mind bending, if I may say so. It shows us how much reading we still have to undertake. I, I particularly appreciate your work on the on the archives. I did try to read, and I guess it's Arabic script, but it's it's different languages, probably uh, different forms of uh, maybe Zanzibari, Swahili, uh, many other languages, and I'm not familiar with them. So. Uh, I was wondering, this is besides my question, but uh, I was wondering if there uh, uh, have been some translations made of these. Uh, if they are, I would very much appreciate getting, uh, uh, you know, some uh, uh, indication of them, only because I'm preparing courses for next semester and I intend to use uh, primary sources and I don't have any from that area. So if you have some of these, I would, uh, or tell me where to look for them, I'd be very, very uh, appreciative. Now, my question really has to do with the, uh, uh, you showed us where uh, um, one of the uh, merchants was traveling to, uh, west into Africa. And uh, I really would like to know more about uh, how widespread this uh, connection is, because we always have the impression that the different parts of Africa were not interconnected. And uh, um, I, I wrote a paper some time ago trying to challenge this, and I would love if you could tell us a little bit more of that. More um, uh, immediately, uh, I, uh, since I'm putting a course on women, uh, I would like to know were women at all involved in these travels besides being, uh, uh, you know, uh, transported as slaves? I, I would love to know if there are, is there material out there that would help us actually, um, you know, study this particular, uh, now there's a lot of work that's it's coming out, but I haven't seen anything that talks about uh, the actual movement of women as travelers, normal travelers, not princesses, not, you know, big thing, but people, uh, you know, who would be traveling back and forth uh, within, uh, over the Indian Ocean, of course, but also within, uh, within the African continent. Right. And I mean, that, I think those are, those are great, are great questions um, uh, to think with. And, could say, say a little bit, I mean, one about the movement of people, we, you know, we see that the caravan trade from the 19th century made it possible for this, like, here's a picture of that Richard, of some man that Richard Burton wrote about called Muni Kidogo, who was, um, had been a Swahili man of, who had been pawned into slavery, um, and, but becomes a caravan leader and expert on the interior, in the interior. And so he marries someone in Tabora in the interior. And so one of the things that, that happens when he's, that we read about, and again, I don't think Burton knows about, is, is Burton's describing what's happening on this, on their trip to try to discover the source of the Nile, but he's some details that, that, that come across. And so kind of reading against the grain of Burton's account, we, we see, um, we see Mwini Kidogo and, you know, when they start getting close to Deborah, he's e really eager to push and to go and get there because his family is there. The rains are starting. He wants to plant um, crops and these kind of things. So we see the way that that coastal Africans um, find their way into the interior and, and build and build lives there. Um, we can also see, again, the status that, that plays out um, in this in the chapter. I try to look at how um, an Omani, a relatively elite Omani and um, someone of more humble Swahili origins get along in the interiors. So that's that's part of that story. 
On women, I mean, here's a picture of uh, that from the the women in the household of Mohammed bin Khalfan al Barwani, who was known as Rumaliza, had been a business partner to Tibetan, Tib, and he was also a member of the al Barwani family. So on that big family tree, he's represented there. And so this is the the people who lived in Ujiji, which is on the um, coast of of Lake Tanganyika, far into the interior. Um, um, Rumaliza himself is, you know, it has to do, is, gets his start in the ivory trade and people, his relatives gambling on him and supporting him. Um, he establishes himself in the interior and ends up being a, one of the leaders of the anti-Belgian forces when the Belgians try to crack down on the, the, the Arabs in the in, interior. But this picture of his household shows the, the, the you know, lots of different women um, who are, you know, wearing coastal dress and wearing congas and this, this kind of thing. The, the missionary account of this, of this suggests that he also had two Arab wives who were there in Ujiji with him, but not, but not pictured. Um, so, there, I, there are not a lot of sources. I've tried to, I've tried to excavate these where, where I can, but it's, it's, harder, it's harder to do that. For sources that you can teach with, I mean, again, if you look at the oceans of paper, um, you, it's not everything is translated, but there are pieces that you can, um, you can some, of the, some of the terms you can, you can work between and, and, and do that. There's also um, in Southern Somalia, in the town of Barawa, there was part of the Zanzibar Sultanate, and in the um, at the end of the 19th century, the Qadis who were who were there kept extensive notes in Arabic, and and these have been collected, uh, translated, and published side by side Arabic and English, a, a, a volume called Servants of the Sharia, two volumes, um, which have tons of of detail um, that you could use for for primary sources, and actually a, a relatively um, well-organized index to help put them put them together. So this is on the in southern Somalia, but again, part of these Indian Ocean networks. So I hope that helps a little bit with the uh, with your question. Mm -hmm. um, Dodi, there was a question by Phoebe um, on um, the South Asian capital in the Oman East Africa kind of um, networks and uh, credit networks in particular. Uh, right. so, sorry to interrupt, but we have uh, Ahmed Al-Mazami and Nicholas Roberts who were in queue. So, okay. so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Okay, I can, I can, I can look at those. Um, I'll, I'll say something quickly about South Asian, uh, Asian capital um, and uh, point you to the work of Holly and Went, who is um, a, you know, is just has a, finished her dissertation a couple of years ago, is an assistant professor at UCLA, and it does fantastic work um, connecting Indian networks in East Africa. Um, and it's incredibly rich, both for its economic history, but also the social history of, of Indian families. Um, and so, you know, this, you know, one of the things that I think about in this case is, you know, Tibu Tip, who um, amassed great deals of credit and part of the, his, his rise is about how he's able to organize larger and larger caravans and attract greater and greater credit. But, you know, on one of his, his major caravans into the interior of East Africa, he delays his departure from Zanzibar to attend the wedding of one of the children of one of his major financiers. This is only a small, it's a small piece mentioned as a throwaway line in his, his autobiography. Um, but to me, this tips us off to the, the rich social world that these things are part of. Not just, these are not just financial relationships, but these, but these finances and these relationships of, of debt are also embedded in social networks of patronage um, and, and credit and clientship. Um, and so that's, you know, I think that, that you know, the people, many of these merchants are living in, in Zanzibar and are neighbors or know of the, you know, 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 know these people. So um, part of what I've tried to do and some of the work comes through in the book is kind of reconstructing neighborhoods and thinking about who lives where, um, because one of the things that these documents do is to list what are the properties that are surrounding the ones that are being put up for a time sale. And so that's one of the ways I was able to make sense of Songoro and Msaba's 
world was in looking at the kind of the the minutia of the minutia and and the and the details of of the this this social world. So th that's a small answer, but I think Holly and Went has much much better answers. Um, so I've, looking at questions in 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 the Q and A, um, you know, you know, why doesn't the Indian Ocean trade culminate in in something like capitalism? I think that uh, scholars working today would suggest actually the Indian Ocean is is one of the things one of the places where we need to start thinking about the history of capitalism. And again, I uh, you know I'll toot the horn once again of Fahad Bishara, who um, as a historian really helps us think about how these kinds of documents um, that I'm looking at for social purposes fit into the history of capitalism in in the Indian Ocean and allow things like speculation and accumulation to happen around while while skirting or staying or staying within um, is Islamic prohibitions on on interest in other things and the, and the way that a kind of Anglo Indian legal tradition makes this possible. So I think that I think that uh, I think that there is scholarship that will will point to this region, not as something that didn't experience capitalism, but actually some that it has its uh, a history of capitalism of its own and the way that those forms of Indian Ocean exchange get merged with other forms of capitalism to, to make and that some of these documents make possible. But again, um, Fahad Bishara's book, Sea of Debt, is, is, is the place to look for that. Um, okay, uh, so right, this question of immobility and rootedness um, the extent, um, did many actors use mobility, but ultimately put down roots and not become mobile? This is, a, is, is key to my analysis because, because part, of what I'm, part of what I'm trying to argue against is what I, what I call a, a coastal chauvinism, um, which assumes that, which, which mirrors in some ways a kind of colonialist historiography, an orientalist historiography that sees the Islamic world of the coast as the, as the place that people want to be. Um, and so analysis that would suggest that traders or other people would go to the interior to make money and then come back to settle in the coast and live, live the life of an exclusive planter. Um, in fact, the, ana the analysis that I do and it comes through in my book is that many people, Juma bin Salim is an example, find their way to the interior of East Africa with through mobility and trade using debt and leveraging property and, and resources from the coast to to get into the interior of East Africa, but then find themselves established in such a way that much better than they could have made for themselves at the coast. Um, heads of household with multiple dependents, access to land, um, you know, farming rice or other, other goods, extensive holding in cattle, a kind of various kinds of, of wealth in, in measures that, that made possible a life that wasn't available to them elsewhere. Um, and so I think that the way that part of what in understanding East African history, we need to think about the, 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 the connection, as you asked in your question between mobility and immobility, like how is it that mobile people come to settle in the interior of East Africa? Sometimes they're avoiding debt, um, for sure, and that, this, that the Sultan's government can't get there to chase it down. But other times they're also building their own lives and, and building the best possibilities for, them, for themselves there. Um, and um, let's... Um, it's okay, so this so my, the question is about efforts to memorialize these Indian Ocean histories and memoirs to tourist narratives and online groups and ref, if, ask if I have reflections on these efforts and how they might weigh as sources to think about the histories discussed in this talk. So I hope that there are some some people here today from the Zanzibar and Oman Facebook group, which is a place where people share pictures um, and connections uh, that between Zanzibar and Oman and, and the worlds that link this. Um, but it's also a, a space where, although I will say everyone is extremely well-mannered and polite, there are strong differences about what, the, what these legacies mean. Um, and so I think that they're, they're um, you know, the sense of violence and displacement that many families experienced after the Zanzibar revolution um, is, is, a, is a critical disjuncture in, the, in this history. And, uh, and I think that the way that these memoirs 
um, the memoirs and, and memorial work around this um, tell us a lot about that that moment and the kind of dispossession that occurred around it. Um, so I think there's a lot of, I mean, again, um, Nate Matthews is doing work on this. Other people are working at, working in this space. Um, there are also a lot of stories still to be told. Um, and so I think we talked earlier about what graduate students could be doing. There are a lot of people who who know this history and can, and can talk about it and, and working between um, their interviews and life histories with them and, and other sources, we can, I think we can, we can better understand, understand this, this period. Um, but it is, it is a highly contested, a highly contested um, history. Um, and, you know, because the sense of belonging, people who have been able to come to, to settle in Oman, people who have not, um, people who have been not had their, their immigration approved, like Jamshid sat for a long time without having that, that approved. Um, so I think we also need to be aware of the politics and the global politics that are taking, to taking place around this. Um, so that, you know, there is a rich material and, and, and part of what I write about in the epilogue of my book is the amount of Swahili language material that's being produced in Muscat. So there are a number of, of of scholars and intellectuals who are creating work written in Swahili, talking about this and weighing in on contemporary historiographical debates. So again, there's lots of, of work for intellectual historians and other people to, to put these together. Um, okay. okay. Could you, Nick and Nate, and then Ahmed, you, you guys, um, you know, if you could unmute yourself one by one and ask your question for, to Dodi, and um, you know he'll answer them maybe together. Um, Nick, if you're there. Hi Uday, and hi Professor McDowell. I'm here. Although it was, my question was about the rootedness or or mobility, which which you answered already. Uh, but in fact, I could ask another question if you'd like me to, um, okay. which about kinship. So again, related to mobility, immobility. To what extent would you say? we have in talking about kinship we also see a lot of these actors um do something new which is start forming networks uh, outside their kinship group uh so trusting in other forms of of uh, networks rather than just being exclusively based in kinship so to what extent would you say that this history is is a space for seeing how human beings throughout the 19th century uh came to perhaps transcend family units um and instead pursue um you know, other types of units or networks? I, I, I think that's a very useful question. And I think that one of the things that we see occurring on the East African coast is a, a kind of blending of Arab identities, you could say, or um, whereas in, in, when we look at the uh, side from Oman, we, you know, the kind of family histories and um, histories of clan and, and movements of clan become important framing devices. And whereas the, the, the Zan people in, in Zanzibar, these lines become a lot more looser um, in terms of, uh, some of them still still play out, but they become, you know, so that the, the, there's a, a way that the category of error becomes more expansive and that the differences are, are flattened to some degree, although part of what I write about in my in my chapter five is that some of the, some undesirable categories of belonging, um, you know, do travel and do still do still operate, and so you know, but but we see the way that the movement into into to East Africa and into the East African interior do flatten some some of these kind of things, and I tried to find ways in which um, tribal affinities like of the Rafri and um, Hanai tensions in, in, in Muscat or in, in Oman played out in, in the interior of East Africa. And I, and I couldn't find those. I couldn't find those. So I, you know, I think that, I think that paying attention to when kinship becomes important and when it doesn't and when it's invoked and when it's not um, is I think an important question. So, and, and so one of the reasons I ended with the, with this genealogical work that's been happening more recently. And again, it echoes what um, Ng Sing Ho tells us about the, um, Hadrami genealogies, but these these texts um, or these mobile texts become ways of creating belonging, creating transnational belonging, and placing people within within kin networks, even if 
they themselves don't aren't in proximity. Um, and part of that, that Barwani tree brings in, you know, people who had gone to, to Jordan in the 1950s, um, people who were from the Congo and other kinds of things. So um, how, how are, and of course there are kins, kin, kinsmen who are excluded or seen as extraneous, not in, in that, but in, in other groups when I've tried to do interviews. Um, so I think paying attention, you know, kinship doesn't, doesn't operate, isn't, it isn't the old functionalist category we might think of, and we need to think about the ways that, that people operationalize it um, and when it, when it works and when it, when it doesn't, because it's, it certainly is not the, uh, an overriding, is not always an overriding factor. Um, and Nate has a question. Do you want to um, ask the question, anything, and you want to elaborate, Nate, on anything you wrote um, in the Q&A? Sure. Uh, thank you for that talk, uh, Dodi, and um, thank you for the uh, kind shout out of uh, me and my work. My, my question, I guess, thinking about the tensions that are generated over the course of the colonial period uh, between Arabs and Africans in East and Central Africa, I, particularly on the East African coast, I'm wondering about the way that um, different lo kin logics uh, or logics of intermarriage um, might generate uh, tension uh, that could then be perceived through broader cultural stereotypes leading to kinds of, leading to, I guess what I'm getting at is logics of racialization. Um, and you know, because we're dealing with a very complex situation of different understandings of what kin means uh, that are in flux. We're also dealing with um, tensions, uh, different religious tensions uh, are, are kind of present here. Um, and so I'm wondering um, at this nexus of kinship, uh, credit, and religion, um, what kinds of tensions do you see this generating and does that have any implications for, you know, the period that comes after the colonial period? I, I, th I think it does, but let me answer that in two ways. I mean, part of it is my own reading of this East African history is that the 20th century colonial categories of race of, you know, Arab, Indian, African, and, and, and the ones that, that ultimately coalesce into the, the charged aspects of, of what becomes the Zanzibar revolution. I, I worry that we sometimes read those backwards in ways that are not, uh, not useful. I mean, when we, when we read with them, we find them. But my, my own sense is that uh, these, the categories were not, and part of what I answered the previous question, were not as rigid um, in, in that period and that the political identities that connect to them that come about in the colonial period and under British indirect rule in the Zanzibar protectorate, but also in other parts of East Africa, um, they reify a set of categories of ethnic categories um, and, and, and put power and privilege into, into some of them. So one of the things I try to do in the 19th century is to be aware of those and to see how those uh, to see to what degree those things did did operate, so that's 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 part of it, and the, and the, these Ken logics. But at the same time, you know, one of the one of the places where we can see the logic of kinship playing out when in the nineteenth century, when 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 married, as it were, to power, is within the the household of Said bin Sultan, and you know, it turns out that it, of his many wives that his the Abyssinians um, were were sort of had their own group. The the Georgians um, had their group, and so so that the children of these of these different women end up also creating alliances along uh, in in these ways. And so that, of course, this is elite in the elite household and of the uh, one of the most privileged families. So it doesn't it doesn't take us all the way through this world, but we can see how even in a very mixed um, heterogeneous um, family setting that there are still logics of, of kinship do create, or, you know, when connected to webs of power, become the the very um, fuel of palace intrigue. Um, and so I think we can we can um, 
we can read those read those more more broadly. So I'm you know I really my my work in this book stops in the early in the early 20th century um, and and doesn't doesn't go into this. I mean I think that that Jonathan Glassman's work and the kind of the way that these ethnic categories and and racial hatred um, come about. Uh, tells tells the story better better than I can. It's it's harder to see it's harder to see these things in the 19th century in some ways based on the sources. But it but it, we do see um, multi ethnic groups uh, and um, sort of working groups and partnerships that are at play in the interior um, and that the kind of intricate networks of patronage and kin do cross all kinds of all kinds of boundaries. Um, so. I guess what I would say is when we when we look backwards to the 19th century, I try to do so with caution about the 20th century, the 20th century categories that we've that we've received and that have shaped so much of that of that, you know, what happens from 1964 happens in 1964 and afterwards. Um, but but I, I question the way that they might apply in an earlier period. Right. Um. Ahmed, did you uh, have a follow-up question that you know maybe wasn't answered, or Ahmed, are, are, are you there? Yeah, and muted himself, so I don't know what the problem is. Yeah, maybe there's an internet. Um... Hello? Yeah, hi. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, hi, Professor McDowell. Um, thank you for this engaging talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my first question was about uh, the sort of tools or methodologies you've drawn on to trace these networks between reading travelogues to reading the walakas to interviewing uh, interlocutors. Uh, you weave together a number of sources to make sense of what you're reading and connecting these networks. Uh, and I'm trying to grapple with the very same questions of how to connect these 19th century families um, and, and try to map out uh, their, their mobilities. Uh, and the other one, um, um, I heard a bit about your uh, next project um, this is a uh, on uh, Bombay and the India connections between Oman and India and I was curious to learn more about it and if it's going to connect Africa as well. Thank you. Um, okay, I mean in the sources it's really hard. I mean I think that the thing that I took from all these Waraka was were being able to have these set of names and 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 making you know part of what I did is go through and and make just databases of, of names and lists of names um, and, and you see some of that in the Ocean of Paper project. But, those, but then um, it meant being able to go back to those and check when I came across a name or a person and, and, and then trying to just really put together these small amounts of information um, so that we could, we could understand, understand these stories. And, and part of what I appreciated about the documents is that they brought to life stories of, and individuals we wouldn't see otherwise. I mean, again, a lot of these... Um, formerly enslaved people um, aren't, don't have a big place in the historical record. And, and it was quite a fortunate find to be able to link Songoro and this, this event on, the, on, on, the, on Lake Victoria with, um, with these particular documents from the Zanzibar archive and, and to understand that it was the same person. And in part because, you know, the missionaries who met him in writing in English sort of understood him one way. And, and so working between these things. So for me, a lot of it was just being able to keep lists of names that I came across and then being able to, to double check those and then think about how these might um, uh, come together and these little to precipitate into something into something more in these these threads of stories. And so I've I've really had to go on with the faith that the these bits of stories and this and the suggestive arcs that they have, the ones I can best pin down, are really just the starting point for a whole set of other other relationships. Um, and so that was reading against travel literature, reading against the archival material, um, you know, putting lots of, trying to put lots of different things, things together. To me, that's one of the fun things about being a historian is, is diving into those, those details and 
you know, for my faults, I think I sometimes get more caught up in the details and the stories than, and than the historiography. So I'm grateful that I have colleagues who are also such keen historiographers um, in, in, in doing that. Um, and tell me that the second part of your question or was about the next, the next project. Yes. So um, in thinking about the Indian Ocean and, the, and movement between the Indian Ocean, I've been looking at the kind of overlapping networks of knowledge of a, a doctor who was in Muscat in the, in the late 19th century and, and seeing the worlds that he occupied. Um, and so there, this project doesn't have uh, the African focus isn't as strong in this one in terms of being able to, to link the, all the sides of the Western Indian Ocean in that way. Um, but part of what comes out and what I'm trying to develop is the way the Muscat throughout this period did have a large African population. Um, and so thinking about the ways that he intersected with those and, and that what the, I mean, one of his early things that he wrote was a, um, was a kind of account of of Muska and its and its and its population, um, and so thinking about kind of how um, this doctor is works as an ethnographer and the kind of and the kind of what the cosmopolitan nature of an Indian Ocean port city like Muska looks like to someone who's who's doing that. So there's not a direct African connection in in that way, um, but that the the presence of Africans and the African connections to Muscat will we'll figure in a little bit. Um, so that's, that's where I am on that. All, all right, um, Dodi, thank you so very much for your brilliant work. I think you did move the historical analysis forward by helping us to understand connections to understand circulation. And if Pierre Larson uh, is correct in his analysis of your work as a body of his scholarship that traces these connections in unexpected ways, then I would like to claim you as a historian among the anthropologists. <laughs> You uh, talked about bread and butter issues in anthropology, clans, kinship. I was uh, absolutely fascinated by Tipu, uh, uh, Tipu Tip, um, your discussion of his relationship and his networks, even with Explorer. Uh, and we know how travelers and explorers, as we know from Johannes Fabian, really uh, set the parameters for colonization and for colon subsequent forms of power and knowledge. So thanks a million. We look forward. I'm holding my breath to reading about the doctor. And uh, I hope that uh, your joining us is going to be a long lasting uh, relationship and involvement. I also want to thank uh, all our friends here, uh, Nate Matthew, um, Fahad Bashara, and all the other people whose names I just uh, read here. So thank you all so very much for attending. And uh, we will make sure that we will bombard you with other invitations. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure and you have, you have such a great group of people that you've attracted to your working group and that you pull in for these things. So I'm very, very appreciative. Okay. To be continued. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much and have a good day or good evening to wherever you are. Take good care of yourself. Bye everyone. And thank you Taha and Zubash and Ashish so much. You're Thank you. Terrific. Thank Absolutely. you.